Catherine, would you wait? Yes. I have always been fascinated in, in ruins. That was my childhood playground. Growing up here in Southern Colorado, there were many adobe buildings that melted over time. It was like people just left. As a kid, I would go into these places and just see what they left behind and how weather and the elements started to expose the building itself, and you could see how the buildings were made. Often people wrote on the beams, and you could see the name of the man who built the house. My first architecture education was just playing in abandoned buildings when I was a kid. You would ask me upstairs if, if I'm from Mexico. I, I'm not from Mexico, but I, I do consider myself a borderland citizen, but a very different border than the one. My name is Ronald Rael. I'm a professor of architecture at the University of California, Berkeley, but they take on the language of both the Native American and the Spanish and Mexican architectural typology. I am from the San Luis Valley in Colorado and grew up in the small village of La Florida. Historically and culturally, this was the northernmost frontier of the Spanish and later the Mexican Empire. It was largely sheep ranching and cattle ranching. Over the years, it became abandoned. Today, this village is population six. It's made up of a couple of adobe houses, my mother's house in the cemetery. I probably gained an interest in uncovering these histories through buildings by working with my father. He was a builder. We would build and fix houses made out of mud. So at a very young age, I was working with him on site. His father was always buying property and fixing it up and, and, and then reselling or whatever. And uh, he, so he always did that. So I knew that Ronald was kind of headed that way. These are the last three remaining pieces of the commercial buildings in Conejos. There's certain importance ascribed to history, important events, important people, but I'm also interested in remembering the things that weren't so important or that were every day, but that they have a different kind of importance. Everybody knew Mr. Gomez. He had a big family. So I like the idea of remembering him So what we've done on this building so far is we've, 
We've gutted it. And now we're going to fix the roof so it doesn't leak anymore. Like most of the buildings, they were, they were flat and they had a dirt roof. And so there's tons of dirt on top. And then over time, they build another roof on top of that and leave the dirt. And then now we're in the state where the roof's been abandoned for so long that it not only is it leaking, but it's leaking onto the earth roof, which makes, you know, you can see the mud and so heavy, and then that starts to weigh down. And then, so that's how buildings die around here. But I'm hoping that we can keep this one alive just a little bit longer. So this is probably the longest I've stayed in La Floria since I was maybe in graduate school. I've been spending my summer in my ancestral village, working on an experiment. Those experiments are about this place using the materials of this place and the traditions of this place. My name is Lodman Arja. I am from Sudan. Um, I went to School of Architecture before I came to Berkeley in Sudan. Lodman uh, had applied to the architecture program at Berkeley and didn't get in, but came to ask why and to wonder what he could do better when he applies in the future. He was such a smart, interested, and passionate person that we accepted him there on the spot. And he dove right in and became a really important part of the team really quickly. That's good. This is an extension cord that my father left me for this project. Totally not superstitious, but I totally am. <laughs> That's the nature of the modern day Latino, no? It's, you're like a superstitious atheist. Yes, sir. That works. So when I was cleaning up this shed for this project, I started to find some of my dad's old tools. So I started to make this little, call it a shrine on the wall, of the tools that I'm finding in the shed, like his welding jacket, fence post driver. I broke my nose once using that. In grad school, I was studying modern architecture and digital design. When I was in the library on the side, I would just look up earthen buildings, not only from here, because I was homesick, but all over the world, which I didn't know so much about. I would discover that many of the architects that we consider modern architects, they, at some point in their career, had designed buildings made out of earth. This discovery that earth was in fact a modern material as well as a traditional material really excited me. I think that that is a good mixture and that's a good mixture and it's harder and we mix them together. We can pull it up. Let's yeah. get all this up. Okay. Are we ready, Logman? 
it looks like we're amateurs, it's because we are amateurs. I was fascinated by the notion that a traditional building construction system can be reimagined in the 21st century. Printing comes to La Floria. What do you think, Mom? It's pretty, right? <laughs> wow. I guess because I grew up in houses made out of adobe, I feel like you can feel an adobe building and a kind of history that's associated with them. It is not just a local history, but it's a global history. We can trace the word adobe back to the Egyptian word atob. It's the same word, it has the same lineage, and we can, we can think of the same dimensions of a brick that are used in Colorado today, the same dimensions of a brick that were used in Egypt. If you think about the development of civilization, the two things that coincided in our own evolution is that agriculture and the growing of wheat and discovering that those unused wheat stalks when they were in the muddy soil became very hard and that you could actually stand those up and begin to build walls so there are many types of earthen technologies two of the most prevalent are adobe and rammed earth adobe is clay and sand and silt mixed with straw and water dried in the sun. And it's used as a, a brick that can be stacked and often stacked in a mortar made out of the same exact material. Rammed earth is it's clay that's not very wet, it's only humid and it's placed between forms and it's compacted. And prior to colonization by the Spanish, Native Americans would make a kind of adobe, but it's more technically called cob. The Spanish introduced the adobe brick, and then Native Americans adopted that tradition. Building an adobe is essentially like 3D printing. You're just adding mud material layer by layer. My name is Virginia Sanfortello. I was born in Savannah, Georgia. I grew up all over the South in Savannah, uh, Southern Georgia, Alabama, and North Carolina. So I'm just going to take apart the 3D printer, uh, this tube here that holds the clay. My undergraduate degree is in environmental design. I didn't start out studying architecture. I think I really loved architecture from the beginning because I realized it would give me an opportunity to work at many different scales. So I could work at the scale of the building and think about the form of a building. I could also work at the scale of the hand and think about custom designing interior components. Ron was an interesting person to sit next to in architecture school because he lived at his desk. He slept there many nights, he ate there, uh, he made wildly mysterious things at his desk out of materials that the rest of us weren't using in architecture school. Several years after architecture school, we reconnected and we've been working together since 2003. This summer is special because we're able to merge the things that we do here with the technology that we've been experimenting with in the Bay Area. 
This is the grasshopper script. So we can visualize using these numerical sliders very quickly to design the object that we're going to 3D print. For the first time, we're bringing our 3D printers out to the high desert here in Colorado. I had no preconceptions of what we were going to do this summer. I just wanted to have a place where I could bring all these factors together and begin to test them. Here, we get to go full on and say, what does it mean to print for two and a half months straight? And what are the challenges that arrive there? Uh, my name is Sandy Kurth. I go to school at UC Berkeley in the Masters of Architecture program. Growing up, my dad and I used to go dig clay along this bay where he's an oyster farmer. Um, and I would make pinch pots and little hand-built functional pottery out of those things. We decided to add it in here. It seems fine. A few months before the end of the semester, Ron brought up that we would be trying to print something out in Colorado here on his family's land with local material. And I knew that there was a rich adobe history here, that the soil is really good for what we were trying to do. Logman, should we set down some layers? The challenges we encountered early on, I mean, there's really challenges on all fronts. There's challenges on material. The material has to be made in such a way that it can work with the machine, so you have to screen it and filter it. Then there are the hardware challenges, everything from the pump to the robot, like the pump can only pump a certain viscosity of mud, so we have to make the mud that viscosity, and if we exceed that, it might bog down, or it might get too hot. And then there's the software issues as well. We've been working on the software for a while, and we've developed it ourselves. But it still has its own glitches, and this robot really is an experimental machine. Of the things that looks rasquache, you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you know what this word rasquache means, and it's not a word that we use here. We have a similar word, uh, but rasquache was adapted by the Chicano movement as sort of recognizing that you're trying to do the the most with the least that you have. And so an example might be like sometimes you go to a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, let's say, in the Salt shakers are made out of a beer bottle, you know. So you took that beer bottle and turned into salt shaker. Now it has value, and but and you're not ashamed of it. You accept that you're doing the best with the least that you have. Here we have a word, kind of similar, say trochi mochi, and it's it's sort of like just ad hoc. But yeah, it's, you get by. And so this is all kind of rasquachi or trochi mochi in a way, and everything's working great, <laughs> which I'm really happy about. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but. I'm happy right now that everything's printing. You want to try printing it that wet? And we'll just go really slow and, and wet, and hopefully it doesn't rain. Weather is also a factor because this robot, it's not necessarily designed to bring to the outdoors, so we had to find ways to weatherproof it and make sure we protect it. Okay. How much is barely? Let's see. Oh no. What happened? The coupling is too small. 
use the hose to wash it out. But the, ho the hose didn't fit in there. No, and I don't understand why. All right, pause it. The hose is plugged. I think if I was a bit aggressive about it, I could find a VC who might give me money, build a better robot, we can print this case study. I know that is absolutely the easy thing to do. The more difficult thing to do, I think, is to convince people of the value of a building made out of Earth. It's still a problem, but I think I think there's a rock in there. I don't know. Some, somehow it became an obsession. Like, why do I have all these adobe houses? I mean, really, when this particular house, my grandparents' house, left my family, I tried very hard to buy it because of the memories that we had here and its, its history in our family. All my life, I had seen houses melt into the landscape. And I have seen in my lifetime the language begin to disappear, and I have seen in my lifetime the people disappear. And I feel like the houses are some of the last permanent vestiges of, of the culture, and I thought it was just important to save them. I think part of the goal here is also to challenge the preconceptions of Earth as a building material, and that, in fact, it's possible to 3D print architecture with traditional materials that have been developed for 10,000 years. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk in, for 30 minutes about 3D printing with the goals and aspirations of arriving at, at architectural solutions using that technology. But I wanted to contextualize this a little bit about where I am from because it has implications in thinking about how this work emerges. I'm from a very particular place in the United States called Valle de San Luis, which is uh, historically the northernmost frontier of Mexico and, and the Spanish Empire. This was the border between the United States and Mexico until 1845. During that time, there was a militarization of that border through the construction of military forts and uh, trading posts. The architecture of these forts is incredibly interesting to me. This I call the Lafayette Head House, and this is the site of one of the earliest settlements in Conejos County. It was a much larger compound. It was sort of a fortification that extended 200 feet back to the creek and created a, a rectangle around a plaza. This is the home of someone named Lafayette Head, and he's an important historical figure. I want to welcome you to the Luther Bean Museum. 
The focus of the museum is really the history, art, and culture of the San Luis Valley and kind of the larger cultural and geographic region. Hello. <laughs> What's your name? Matias. Matias. Matias, yeah. This is a selection of objects that we have from Lafayette Head. He was a soldier in the Mexican-American War and fought in battle in New Mexico. And after the war, settled in Abiquiu, New Mexico, and married an Hispano woman. After settling in Abiquiu, he recognized that there was still a Mexican land grant available in Colorado, and he gathered families from Abiquiu to come to Colorado to settle this land grant. He gained some political power and became the first lieutenant governor of the state of Colorado, and he became a Ute Indian agent. And this house, or what remains of it, was the Ute Indian Agency and, the, and his uh, lieutenant governor's mansion, as, as they call it. There's an interview with his nephew, and he's saying, oh, my uncle's head's compound is the most well-built and best-built house in Conejos. But to me, it's amazing that Victorian, every surface is Yes, covered. every surface. <laughs> and with a different with pattern. pattern. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, that looks very affluent. <laughs> Area, it was covered in concrete plaster, cement plaster, and that was pretty common for a lot of the buildings in the 50s. But the problem with that is that it doesn't allow the adobe to breathe. Eventually, a lot of these houses started getting wet behind the cement plaster, turning the wall to mud and collapsing. This happened to churches and houses all over Colorado and New Mexico. Ooh, what a difference, huh? Did you guys come in here before? What a difference. Mm -hmm. The space feels so much bigger. So most of what I've done is a lot of cleaning and also there were years of additions to the surfaces and I removed all of that to the historical layers of the house. That's where the ceiling used to be. So I pulled away the ceiling all the way back to the original structure, which is, is these giant log beams, vigas as we call them, which just means beams in Spanish. But This building was really known for its kind of grandeur as these, head, these various headquarters. I think it's important to maintain that aspect of the history of this house. Can you tell us what this building is? <clears throat> So, this is a continuation of this house that would have wrapped the entire courtyard. Oral history tells us that this was the slave quarters for this compound. It sort of makes sense architecturally because it had a very grand front where you've welcomed guests, a very long porch that maybe was the place where Indians could gather but not enter into the house. And as you go further back, usually there's the servants' quarters. My cousin Esteban is an expert on this, and he can talk more about that. My name is Esteban Rael Galvez, and I am the former state historian of New Mexico and the former senior vice president at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I can't wait to see. I first encountered Lafayette Head when I was doing research for my dissertation on slavery. He occupies it. So as I walk into this house, and I walked into it before, but as you've started to pull back these layers, I'm just so amazed. But I want to know where are these vigas from? Right. Right? Tracing the architecture of slavery. Lafayette Head didn't build this house. Right. This was built by slave labor. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay. So we are standing on a very important historical site, and what's interesting about this particular place, Conejos, is that it was founded by 
the residents of Abiquiu. And Abiquiu, New Mexico, was a what's called a Genisaro town. Genisaro is a word to describe indigenous people who have been stripped of their Native American ancestry through slavery and become Hispanicized. I'll share one story that was told to me by a man named Demetrio Valdez, who grew up in the section of the building here that no longer exists. My name is Demetrio Valdez, and I'm 72 years old, and I lived in Cornell's County all my life. He said that his grandfather mentioned that one day, Apaches came with Navajo children in front of the church, and they called out to the priests and said, would you like to buy these children? And the priest came out and said, no, we are not slave traders. We will not buy them. So the Apaches just killed all the orphans right in front of everybody. So the next time they brought orphans, the priest said, yeah, we can let these kids die, give them whatever they want. And so the priest would buy the children and they distribute them amongst the families in the community through adoption and they would become baptized Catholic, and they would become Hispanicized, and they would grow up in the families as servants of the families, but also as family, because they grew up since they were infants, and they would marry into the community as well. And this is the legacy of this community that exists here. Basically, these individuals were captured as mostly as very young children. Most of them were women. They began to be raised in these families, and going back home was not an option necessarily. They had been so severed from their natal community. Lafayette Head had a number of these children that he baptized. And while he was the, the main person who documented all of the slaves that were held by families in this area, he never documented his own. This is one of the most incredible documents. He lists the baptismal name of these captured Native Americans. He lists the name of the owner, and he uses the word owner. He lists where purchased, of whom purchased, and when purchased. For me, I guess I resist the glorification and even the telling of the story of Lafayette Head too much because because we have those stories already. And what we don't have is a story of Alejandro Head, the indigenous person that lived in that compound and maybe carved the vigas, who maybe mudded the building. And we don't have the story of my great-great-great-grandmother. Manuelita Cisneros. She was, a, she was a matriarch of my branch of the Rael family that lived in Abiquiu. She was taken when she was about five years old. She was baptized as Cisneros. That wasn't her name. We will never know her name. And that's part of the story of slavery anywhere and certainly true here. If Ronald and I could use Lafayette Head so that we can tell those stories, that's what I want to do. I now own this property, and I'm working with a number of people, many of who are here in the audience today, to think about the future of this site, archaeologically, historically, culturally, architecturally. And I also hope that the way it's restored allows us to make new things. Like, it's just not a frozen thing in time that says, there, we preserved it, read about Head and all the things that he did, but instead, it's part of an evolving thing that propels creativity and knowledge, that gives birth to culture rather than mark its death. I think creative responses are also ways to measure an evolving moral that one has about a place, right? Because even the conversation I've had over the last two years or so about the head house and indigenous slavery, I see how the morals are shifting from, like, oh, there was never any slavery, to, 
oh, that's not slavery, that is tradition, to, oh, oh yes, there was slavery, to now I think, like, oh, we were those slaves. All of us who are from here are indigenous to this landscape. And so whether in the capacity of being uh, a descendant of someone who was a slave or descendant of someone who held a slave, um, those are the ways that we are connected to that past. So I'm learning a lot from place, from the things that I'm finding here, the conversations I'm having with people. I think I'm connecting more with my indigenous ancestry and my traditional ancestry. It's something that maybe I haven't done since I was a, a kid. And I see the, the indigenous technologies that, that gave life to this in, in the first place. The origin of the Pueblo people go back as my grandmother would have said, when the rocks were soft. So the origin story tells of all of these communities. There used to be hundreds, and they were all interconnected, but all speaking different languages, Tewa, Keris, from Zuni, Hopi Pueblos that continue to dot the landscapes in Arizona and New Mexico to as far north as Taos. It's a rather small museum, but we have quite an eclectic collection. So we have some really wonderful examples of the Pueblo pottery. And this is a Santa Clara pitcher. We don't know the exact history, but could be a potter from both heritage of Santa Clara and the Hispano influence. Okay, so this is a, um, one of the Picaris pots. Wow. And so what makes it gold? So that's the, the micaceous clay from northern New Mexico. It seems so precious, but it's amazing that they were just used. I know. Like, I think they're great to show students because obviously you see their vessels, but they've sort of lost that connection a little bit to use. There used to be hundreds of these pueblos across the landscape in, in what is now known as northern New Mexico. There are 19 pueblos left. So the effect of, of conquest and colonialism was, in one way of thinking about it, devastating. And yet, at the same time, to be able to say that there are 19 Pueblos and that they are thriving is pretty special. You don't have that in many parts of, of the nation, where people can touch a wall, as you can in Taos Pueblo, and say, my people have lived here for thousands of years. I feel like a little bit of grittiness in this one. Yeah. yeah. And I try to leave some sand because the the clay, when it has more grit, doesn't work as much. Mm -hmm. So you can make plates and stuff. I need like just the perfect amount of sand and for it to not work, but for it to not break. Right. Um, oh, it's softer. It's almost it's, like waxy or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he uses for his plate. That's almost what you use exclusively, you know? Yeah. Johnny hosts these dinners in a project that he does called Shed, where he is the chef and he harvests um, local foods and presents them to a group over the span of several hours. We initially debated on taking you to the Taos spot or the Lamadera spot. Yeah. And this is the Taos clay. But it works a lot better for coil building. So you're thinking that the 3D printing, the coil, it's pretty much a like coil building. So right. I think this one will work. Mm -hmm. Then I can print with it this afternoon. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> Take it in the morning, print with it in the evening. <laughs> I grew up in Taos, on the Taos Pueblo. 
most of my ancestors uh, were native to this area. We'll take a shovel and we'll just go around the perimeter on the inside and just scoop a little fit out and see if there's a spot that looks better than others. Mm. And that's just, it's just more of the, the pure clay. But look, you can see the, the paint. Just pure yeah. mica, basically. Yeah. Pure mica, and then you got like some of the rose quartz probably, and then some of that sandstone. All of these 3D printers and these labs around the world are so clean and you have the technology and the equipment there, you buy the materials. And to be able to like forage for or harvest your own materials and get out into the landscape and take it out of that kind of pristine environment, I think is the ultimate goal. Mexico, uh, there's still that underlying kind of prejudice. And so, you know, people at the Pueblo tend to be Pueblo. People outside the Pueblo tend to be Hispanic. Yeah. It's changing a little bit. Isn't that pretty? Yeah. It's a tradition when you're digging clay to bring something to say thank you to the ground, the earth, to the clay that's being made under our feet. And this is definitely someone who's been making pottery out of this clay and then coming back and breaking it ceremoniously to say thank you. Like you leave for college and like I also left when I was around 19 and then you leave and then you you're just not connected to all of this for a while. So I have to remember all this. It's good to have you back. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be back. All right. So I just want to process it by breaking it up into very small pieces and letting them dry here in the sun, probably for the rest of the day. I think the thing that resonates with me most is, is the material and the kind of haptic qualities of the material. So the way it feels when I touch it. I like to think about the way this bowl fits in my hand perfectly, or whether it's hot or cold or soft or warm. So this is the clay after it's been sitting for a little while and the water's evaporated out. And this would be really good for 3D printing with. Come on. Ron, come look at our wild clay. Which one is that? That's the uh, heavily micaceous clay. Oh, wow. So this is a, a piece of 3D printed micaceous clay pottery. And I'm coating it with the wild micaceous clay that we harvested from northern New Mexico. When I design buildings, I think I think about those same haptic qualities. I think about space, but I think the way material affects us is probably more important to me and the thing that I think about first. This was my, my grandfather's office, he called it La Oficina. 
And he had a wood stove here. After a day of chopping wood and feeding the cows and everything, to come in and sit here on the chair and have a little whiskey. Chopping wood out there, I just remembered. I said, oh, my grandpa used to have a sharpening stone back there. I wonder if it's still there. And so we dug it up and we plugged it in. And sure enough, it still works. Oh, yeah, it's pretty sharp. <laughs> now you're a man, son. It's always exciting to have Matthias be a part of the project. For this most recent structure that we're 3D printing, Matthias has been chopping the palitos or the little wood sticks that make the fur. We were thinking about the idea of making furry architecture, which is something Ron and Virginia have been sketching and modeling for quite some time. Basically, each stick goes through the inner wall and the outer wall, and then creates this nice aesthetic furriness while also tying together the structural system. One of the design inspirations for this structure would come from West African architecture, uh, the likes of architecture that we've seen it in Mali and Cameroon. We can take on structural problems, we can do these sorts of things, but sometimes the artistic experiments lead us into directions that become really useful, but they're useless in the beginning. Time is running out fast. We have to head to El Paso and Juarez, and we only have four more days to print this structure, to clean and pack everything up. We might be printing to the last minute. I think one of the most exciting things for me about this whole process is that we can 3D print local clays and sands to make walls and enclosures. We can make other architectural components such as stairs. We can make interior components such as furniture and hearths. And we can also use those same clays to 3D print vessels that can be used in the interior as well. These are the micaceous clay cookware. This is a bean pot, and it has a lid. This is a tagine, and plates and bowls. When it's fired, you have something strong that lasts forever, and it's not plastic. It also feels good. <laughs> so we're talking about architecture, furniture, and objects all made out of the same materials using the same technology. Isn't it fascinating how the simple act of drawing a line on the map can transform the way we see and experience the world? and how those spaces in between lines, borders, become places. And those lines drawn on a map can actually create scars in the landscape, and they can create scars in our memories. My interest in borders came about when I was searching for an architecture of the borderlands. You might be familiar with this well-known traffic sign it was designed by graphic designer John Hood, a Native American war veteran working for the California Department of Transportation. And he was tasked with creating a sign to warn motorists of immigrants who were stranded alongside the highway and who might attempt to run across the road. And he was very careful in thinking about using a little girl with pigtails, for example, because he thought that's who motorists might empathize with the most. And he used the silhouette of the civil rights leader, Cesar Chavez, to create the head of the father. 
Hood related the plight of the immigrant today to that of the Navajo during the long walk. Tonight, an unusual display at the border he is getting lots of attention. You'll see why. The teeter-totter wall is the brainchild of two Bay Area professors, one here at UC Berkeley, another at San Jose State. They say the project is a decade in the making, and it was installed and dismantled in one day. The wall is not only dividing places, it's dividing people, it's dividing families. And the unfortunate politics of the wall is today is dividing children from their parents. As Noam Chomsky describes it, it's an architecture of violence. So what does it mean to walk into the space of violence and attempt to disempower it? This is a place where people live. But I think it's artists that allow one into those spaces and allow one to see them in different ways. To understand that within those spaces of violence, life must continue. And what is life without joy? I wanted to build upon the brilliance of this sign to call attention to the problem of child separation at the border, and I made one very simple move. I turned the families to face each other. Because there's a, a long history of indigenous slavery in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, my family is part of that history. When I think of that sign of reunite, that that little girl is a little girl who is suffering the problems of child separation today, but that little girl is also our grandmothers who suffered those same issues 150 years ago. Gentle, because you know, this paint is... I think that's good, Hito. That's good. This is my, this is my great-grandmother, uh, Marina, and my great-grandfather, Miguel Francisco Varela, if you look here, his hand looks a lot darker than her hand. Yes, he's very dark. I think she's wearing a glove, though. Oh. She is wearing a glove, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> but she was very fair. My grandma Marina, I knew her. Matias loves coming to Colorado. He loves visiting his grandmother. He feels very comfortable here. Part of me thinks that that's because this, this place is embedded in his DNA. His ancestors have lived here for 11 generations, and I think he can't help but feel at home here. This was the Spanish cemetery for La Florida that served the community of La Florida and, and Lobatos. And this is where my family's buried. I'm related to many of the people in, who are in this cemetery, but this particular section here is mostly my mom's family and also my father's buried here. This is my father's gravestone here, Miguel, Miguel Arturo Israel. And I thought that for Matias, he's the last boy who holds this name, and so in a sense, it's kind of a gift to him also that I thought if he ever wanted to know his own history, it wouldn't be lost in some computer file or, or in some piece of paper that burned down, but it would be etched in stone. Last summer, the structures that we made were 
Our first experiments, building something, the height of the printer. We left the Bay Area sooner than we would have because the semester went entirely online. So the pandemic has, you know, I guess it allowed us to do a project bigger than we had ever done before. This summer, we put that all together. The new thing is we're printing much taller and then we're printing faster by using a rail. This is our first experiment where we're really thinking about legitimate doors and, and windows and it's matured to the extent that now we're building something that's closer to a building than last year. Logman and Sandy, they've both graduated and they're moving on with their lives. It's hard, you know, you build relationship, you build projects, you build a bit of history, and then they go on to make their own histories. Sandy's now pursuing his PhD at MIT and Logman is pursuing one of the projects that was a part of being here. He's been working on developing a cook stove that is smokeless. I guess we're working on it together. And then there would be no escape of, of heat. Also, the thermal property of the clay itself. To produce sort of several thousand or even hundred thousand of these stoves to distribute to people in West Africa, starting in Sudan in his home country. Do you feel a connection to your dad when you do this kind of work? I mean, if my dad was here, he would definitely be contributing. Because when I was working on these projects, even though he had worked all day, he would show up and he'd say, okay, I'm gonna do the wiring on this house, or let's plaster this house, or I'm gonna call stones, or you have to go to college now, so I'm gonna finish it for you. And so I imagine if he was here today, one, he'd be amazed by the printer, but he'd probably be out there shoveling dirt and loading it in the printer. I think he'd like seeing this process. The name of this project is called Casa Covida, and it's named that because it's the house for cohabitation. There's a bathtub for two, there are two benches around a hearth, two beds so you can look at the sky. It's also a house that we constructed during the time of COVID. I have traditionally shared a lot of things on social media. And people have come here after they've seen it on Instagram. Some are clay artists, ceramic artists. Some people are architects, interested in architecture. Some are interested in earth building. There are archeologists and historians and journalists. Even just friends locally who come and see this, and that's connecting me more to the place as well and opening up new conversations about all the things that this work is about, about being here in a historic borderland, the traditions of this place as they change over time. We're living here and it's alive. This house is part of us now. Welcome 
everyone to La Florida, Colorado. This is a village that my family's living in for seven generations. And this is behind me, Casa Covida. It's a house for cohabitation that we built now during the time of COVID when we relocated here to my ancestral village. And so I thought that I would first um, give you a little tour before the sun goes down of Casa Covida. Come on along. I'll show you my laptop stand really quickly. So the first room inside is a space for gathering. And you can see that it is a space with seating. And so we can, two people can sit and hang out and talk. And um, we have a fireplace where we can actually cook. One thing about this space is that it has these amazing oculi up into the sky. And so while we were considering a roof for this building, um, we're also really taken by the fact that we can see the sky and the stars and the clouds are moving overhead. Over here is the wonderful room for two people to sleep. We're working with some friends, indigenous weavers, who are uh, wove these beautiful textiles for us, these beautiful pillows. This one actually has the plan of Casa Covina on it. So you see the, the heart space, the bathing space, and the sleeping space. And then there's this beautiful view out into the field through this window. And one final view from just a week ago. A week ago? Yeah, this was a week ago. It seems really crazy because it's so nice and sunny and warm right now. But um, just a week ago, we had this uh, crazy snowfall of about, uh, close to a foot.